Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a media platform aimed at understanding the path taken by Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean which has experienced a vibrant past and has much potential for the future. Our topic for discussion today is identity politics, nationalism and women in Sri Lanka. We are indeed honoured to have with us today a senior lecturer from the Department of History at the University of Colombo, who is also an alumnus of the University of Peradeniya and she earned her PhD from the University of York. Dr. Janaki Jayavardhana, welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding. Thank, Thank you. you so much for taking time to join us. When we talk about diversity, and we look at the past and we look at uh, what we experienced for centuries. It's not something that came with colonialism. We've had diversity at the time of the kings, going back into ancient times. How was this managed? How was this possible at that point? How did this affect identity and its interpretation of identity at that juncture? I think, uh, I mean, from my own point of view, perhaps diversity is a misunderstood concept. Right, when we talk about a, even yesterday I was talking to some of my students, when we talk about plurality or diversity, what people tend to think is that there are very like uh, compartmentalized cultures and you know communities living together, no interaction. They have their own culture, language, religion, etc. And this is how most of the time I think diversity is understood. But from a point of a historian, it's a bit different, right? Diversity means like uh, coexistence of different practices, uh, uh, rituals, uh, norms. But at the same time, you know, you respect that and accept it. I mean, this is what I see with the ancient times or, or pre-colonial times of Sri Lanka, right? When we look at the communities in the pre-colonial times, what actually we can see is more of uh, shared cultural aspects. Because within that diversity, there is this sharing aspect as well. So if you try to understand that society in the mindset of today, you can't understand that society. Because they didn't think the same way as we do, for certain. Uh, with evidence, I can say that. Even the dress, mm. for example, that's one of my uh, you know, uh, favorite topics. If we look at the dress patterns of the ancient people, pre-colonial people, not only Sri Lanka in the region called South Asia, but also in Southeast Asia, you see similar dress patterns, right? And also there was no gender difference between men and women in way of dressing, right? So likewise, in like various perspectives, you can see how things have been shared. So this is where I think the people have learned to respect each and every cultures, religious practices whatever they, they, they practiced at that time. With the advent of the colonizers, obviously you have a lot more identical identity representation taking place. We have influences on language, certainly on culture, on food, on clothing, on so many sectors taking place with the advent of the colonizers. How has this affected understanding of Sri Lanka? How did this impact Sri Lankan identity? Hmm. Like when I am talking about the impact of colonialism on identities in Sri Lanka, in term, when talking in terms of ethnicity and all, I'm not saying certain terms that are actually, you know, uh, uh, used to describe the present day ethnic communities were not mm. absent in the pre-colonial times. Some of the Sinhalese were there, the term Tamil is there. And along with that, there were other kind of uh, identities as well. You know, uh, Professor Gunavardhana and uh, Professor Bandula Tilaga and some, some uh, other historians actually have talked about this, right? Uh, these terms existed mm -hmm. even before colonialism. But the, the, the important question is whether these terms derived the same meaning mm -hmm. at that time. Right? Uh, 
I think uh, when we talk about the history of Sri Lanka, Mahavansa is the most uh, you know uh, commented uh, uh, chronicle uh, and cited chronicle mm. in uh, in Sri Lankan when 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 we write or talk about Sri Lankan history. But if you read the same chronicle carefully, you see different viewpoints as well, right? At the same time, people can interpret certain episodes of uh, the past as, you know, uh, in, a, in a nationalistic uh, uh, understanding uh, rather than ethno-nationalist mm. understanding. But at the same time, the same chronicles provide us enough of examples to see that, you know, uh, pluralism practiced and existed in that era. Mm. So what happens in the colonial times, I mean, it's not in sense of dress patterns or whatever, uh, it's the knowledge formation at the co colonial times, especially during the British colonial period that actually impacted the identities of Sri Lankans, right? Like uh, what I'm saying is that, as I have said earlier, not that identities were existing, but the, the existing identities were given a different meaning or rather I can say that identities were reconstituted during the British colonial period uh, as Nira Vikramasinghe and others have been uh, you know explained uh, the the main reason for that was that uh, when the colonial uh, rulers have come to this country they couldn't understand the society in order to you know rule the the colonials and also in order to you know, extract uh, profits from this colony. Mm. So what they did was they tried to understand the colonial society by way of using techniques in Europe, existed at Europe at that time, right? One is mapping us and one is uh, categorizing and classifying us into groups, right? So, uh, what happened was they used the uh, census and other kind of techniques to map us. So, with that knowledge formation, they have come to the conclusion there are a few ethnic groups are residing in this country by early 19th century. Before that, you know, uh, the uh, census were taken from uh, uh, late uh, 19th century, in the first census, they couldn't classify us as national groups or ethnic groups. So what happened was they used the caste because that was the existing, you know, mechanism to, you know, create hierarchies within societies or in India and in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. as well. So even the Europeans were categorized as a caste. Right? Then there was an overlapping of caste. There were Sinhalese, then there were Govigama and some other caste as well. Uh, the Muslims were categorized as a caste and also as a group, right? Likewise. Then the then they used the color, blacks and whites, right? And then in early late 19th century, the term nationalism has been you know used to understand the groups in Sri Lanka and, and in census there were like uh, 82, 72 nationalities were identified in Sri Lanka. That's from that point of nationalism that we want to continue yeah. and when we come back with the Sri Lankan understanding we're going to look at national movements, nationalism movements in the country, the role that gender played in this process in Sri Lanka in the period from uh, the colonial period into that of independence and up to the present when we return with the Sri Lankan understanding in conversation with Dr. Janaki Jagatta. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan understanding. We're in conversation with Dr. Janaki Jayavardhana and we're talking about identity politics, nationalism and gender in Sri Lanka. 
Dr. Janaki, when we look at nationalism movements in Sri Lanka, you know, we've had several over periods of time. Could you identify some of those main movements that took place in this country? Hmm. Yeah. Um, if we talk about nationalism, in again, in a historical point of view, uh, some historians argue, like Professor Sirima Giribamuna or Gompich, that uh, there was a prototype nationalism existed in uh, Rajarata civilization by way of analyzing Mahavansa, right? It's kind of debatable, but that idea is there, right? But uh, up until the British colonial times, we don't see a nationalist movement as such, but there were religious revivalist movements in the 19th century, 18th century, which perhaps paved the way for Sri Lankans to think about unity among groups. So when in 1832, uh, Colbrook and Cameroon, uh, when they you know, suggested to have a, a parliament system, you know, parliament type of uh, governance in Sri Lanka, they very clearly said, uh, you know, we need to curb the power of the, the uh, governor and give more power to an assembly which actually can look after the needs and interests of the people in this country because people live in poverty and destitute. So, and also they said, you know, because Sri Lankans are not very familiar with uh, electoral type of representation, uh, we should have, uh, have members who actually are prominent in society, who are well recognized by the society. So what happened was, when uh, non-official members were selected to the, or nominated to the assembly, the colonial rulers thought best form of representation is race. So they elect, uh, yeah, so, so they uh, uh, appointed, uh, you know, prominent, members of each and every race. So that actually in a way violated what mm. uh, Colbrook and Cameron has suggested. Mm -hmm. But the understanding was that we have these three, four different races living in Sri Lanka. In terms of gender, how in terms of gender coming into yeah, this picture yeah. here, so then you can briefly tell us how gender yeah, gets involved yeah. here. So what happened was uh, when the nationalist movement was born against colonial rule, the nationalist leaders needed to think we are a homogeneous group in Sri Lanka. Tamils, Muslims and you know the Sinhalese are very much separated, you know, different groups that living in this country. Because that actually uh, you know uh, helps us to understand the nationalism in terms of, you know, at that time, right? What we practiced at that time was not civic nationalism as the British have accept, has expe accepted, so expected. Rather, we want to think that we have three different nations living in Sri Lanka okay. by way of, you know, adopting the, the very traditional type of uh, you know, uh, uh, interpretation of nationalism that existed in Europe at that time. That's so a very valid point, I think, where mm -hmm. we're talking about that historical perception, whether it is in terms of a concept, whether it is in terms of a period of history, uh, how we interpret it. That yes. is something that yes. we have to be very, very uh, mindful of. So, so the 19th century society was not that, not like that. There were no such homogenized groups mm -hmm. and uh, you know as uh, Esposito explains uh, modern societies are you know they are emerging and re-emerging constantly so we need that homogenized coherent you know one 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 community into in in, in order to 
uh, have the power to make decisions in this country. Exactly. You know, so this this uh, uh, you know politics of ruling and politics of understanding the the people in this country actually you know uh, went hand in hand hand at that time. So what happened was actually um, traditions were invented to demarcate us into ethnic groups. That is where the gender played a very crucial role. Like for example, I was talking about the dress, right? Uh, most of the Europeans when they came, came like the, their first observation in this country is like from behind you can understand, you can't understand whether it is a man or a woman, right? So, women used to, sorry, men used to have long hair tied up like Do women not. and most me men and women did not cover the upper part of the body, bare breasted and they used a, you know, what they call petticoat, just a piece of cloth and um, so, it was the British actually according to Nira Vikramasinghe that uh, uh, in their official ceremonies prescribed a certain dress that actually represent ethnicities or race groups in this country. So, we followed the patterns and we needed this you know very you know differentiated uh, ethnic groups. So, likewise. Uh, what Dharmapala said in his uh, Gidinacharya uh, uh, leaflet in uh, 1894 is that Sari not Osariya is the dress for the Sinhalese women. So, he said uh, wearing red the hatte is not for Sinhalese women and not the European uh, dress. So, likewise, he very clearly uh, described what a Sinhala group is. Similarly, it, it happened with the Tamils as well. So, that is where then you know we need to carry on these differences and it was understood if you look at the literature, especially the newspaper articles and all in the early 20th century, what it very clearly says is that the the developing the country is in the hands of men and preserving the culture is in the hands of women that is the service that women can do to the nation right therefore lots of rules and regulations have been you know invented in my point of view to make that women are different from men Exactly. So, same thing that Dharmapala has said according to H. L. Seniviratna, what, what H. L. Seniviratna says was Dharmapala's vision was to have a developed country as a any any western country, but a, but with a culture like in Japan, because Japan was not colonized and he, he assumed that the culture in Japan is pure. So, likewise he brought examples from the past and said you know this is how men should be and women should be this is the role of women this is the role of men so that was taken by the other people as well exactly yeah thank you thank you very much dr janaki when we come back after the break we're going to look at the future the scope of identity in terms of interpretation which is a term that we need to be very very aware of when we return with the sri lankan understanding Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We are in conversation with Dr. Janaki Jayavardhana on identity politics, nationalism and gender in Sri Lanka. Dr. Jayavardhana, when we look at the future and we comprehend what has been, we have gone through a lot. You have mentioned so many aspects from pre-colonial periods to colonial periods to post-independence periods. What are the main lessons that we can learn as we surge into the future? Yeah, yeah. we were talking about uh, I think uh, identities in terms of gender and in terms of nationalism and, and in terms of uh, ethnicity as well, right? Unfortunately, we went through a long term civil war 
due to our misunderstanding of the past mainly because the past has been interpreted by um, intellectuals, politicians in, in advantage of certain ethnic groups and the results of that is that uh, you know today the understanding is that we are a diverse community as, a, as like very very separate you know separated communities that do not have any, any interaction between mm -hmm. each other which was not true in the past as I have said. So, in terms of gender what has happened was with the colonial intervention, knowledge formation and also the, the nationalist, nationalist leaders understanding of gender resulted in women losing many rights that they have had in the pre-colonial times, right. And very clearly English judge Sawyer say uh, and also another uh, co uh, other colonial uh, you know uh, civil ser servants also say that Sri Lanka Sinhala society is not a, a son preferred society because women have had lots of uh, uh, privileges and we lost everything when the British uh, introduced marriage ordinances because the marriage system was different. We practiced uh, uh, monogamy and bigamy, polygamy and polyandry as well. In, in the eyes of the colonials, it was uh, savage, barbarian. So, they wanted to change that. So, lots of laws were changed and then the wage labor was introduced with all these you know changes, structural changes and also ideological formations at the time, women lost many um, uh, privileges they have had in uh, pre-colonial societies and you know new form of patriarchy emerged. So, we and but the understanding is like 2500 years of all, all history women behaved like this way which is wrong. If we want to you know think in terms of equality and equity for women, we need to have a proper understanding of the past, what has happened in the, especially what has happened in the colonial period, the structural changes we went through and what happened to women's status and role in the family and in society, right. And in terms of ethnicity, unfortunately, still in the political system, we practice racism, right. Still, uh, one thing is that uh, the nationalism in the early 20th century was to you know uh, do away with colonialism, breaking away from the empire. But the nationalism that emerged from 1970s is ethno-nationalism where we tend to look for separatism, mm. right. So, uh, in that point of view, if we look at the politics in this country as I have said, still is based on racism. Lots of uh, uh, many uh, uh, political parties that based on religion or et ethnic uh, you know in ethnic terms have emerged and also even the main political parties when they select candidates it is always based on the race. No one think of you know sending a Sinhalese to you know contest in Jaffna, mm. similarly in other areas because that shows us even though we have democratic institutions in place, we are not democratized yet. So, main reason for that is also our way of understanding who we were in the past. So, the school curricula do not talk about these things, still we you know have this traditional type of history uh, learning in schools. The politicians misinterpret the past, the intellectuals also do the same. So, in my view, I think you know we need to talk more about this you know type of uh, knowledge that emerged during last few uh, decades. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Jayavardhan. That's an excellent point for us to close our program today, where whether we talk about diversity and interpretation of diversity, whether we talk of ethnicity from a nationalism perspective, gender perspective, uh, there's something that we're probably missing, and that is this one uncommon denominator that we have of Sri Lankanness. This is Sri Lanka is very diverse, in, in a very open, in a very plural understanding of the word diverse. And this is where understanding what this country has done in the past, the potential this country has enjoyed, is something that is going to propel us into the future. And so I guess that is one of the main draw outs that we take from this particular session. When we talk about identity politics, nationalism, the role of gender, when we look at this from a Sri Lankan perspective, this country has enjoyed, has experienced, has exercised plurality in a very, very uh, open manner. Going into the future, these are lessons that we learn, these are lessons that we take forward. That was the Sri Lankan understanding for today. Join us again next time when we bring you another session where we focus on Sri Lanka, the island in the Indian Ocean with a vibrant past and huge potential for the future. Thank you.